Okay, uh, problem 3.20 says to test the energy time uncertainty principle for the wave function in problem 2.5 and the observable x by calculating sigma h, sigma x, and d expectation value of x with respect to dt exactly. So immediately, first off, let's define problem 2.5. So the wave function that we were given in that problem is a mix of the first two stationary states of the infinite square well, where we have psi, whoops, my, there we go psi of x comma zero is equal to some normalization constant a multiplied by psi one of x plus psi two of x where these psi's psi n is defined as the stationary states for the infinite square well so root two over a multiplied by sine of n pi over a multiplied by x so what are we being asked to do? Well, we're given sigma h, we're given sigma x, and we're given dx, or d expectation x by dt. These are the values we're told to calculate, and we're told that from this, we want to somehow derive the energy time uncertainty principle delta e delta t has to be greater than or equal to h bar over 2, right? So if we want to do this, well, how do we relate these values to these values. Immediately, uh, half of this is already done for us. We know that delta, or we know that sigma h, aka the uncertainty in the Hamiltonian, is directly just defined as the uncertainty in energy, right? So that that's one part of uh, this problem, sort of solved for us. Next, we recognize that in the same way, uh, sigma x is the uncertainty in position, right? So if we have sigma x being equal to delta x, and we have d expectation x with respect to dt, how do we take these and somehow convert them into delta t, right? Well, we know that d expectation x by dt is the time derivative of the expectation value of x, right? So what is this truly? This is the rate at which the expectation value is changing. Remember that from this chapter, we define delta t to be sort of this arbitrary thing, which defines the amount of time it takes for my system to change significantly, or, or on some significant level. So we can arbitrarily define delta t in terms of delta x and say that, okay, suppose that delta t is the time it takes for my system to change by my uncertainty in x, delta x. So let's say that this is equal to delta x by delta t, right? And once again, Right? Remember the key point of this section, which is that the time energy uncertainty principle sort of has a bit of interpretation room for us to do, right? The, the, what specifically constitutes a, like a significant change in a system is sort of arbitrary and we can define it as we go. In this case, we're just going to force this relation. We're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna say that the time it takes for this system to change on some significant level is for the expectation value of X to change by the standard deviation of X. So if we do that in that case, this tells us that we can say delta t is just directly equal to delta x divided by the time derivative of the expectation value of x, like this. So in that case, if we substitute all these in, our energy time uncertainty principle is now going to be sigma, or whoops, just messed that up, uh, sigma h multiplied by sigma x over d expectation x by dt. And we're trying to find what this equals, right? This is going to be greater than or equal to something. Or I suppose in this case, h bar over 2 in order to be in agreement with our minimum uncertainty level. So ultimately, we're trying to find what these three values are, right? And we know way back from chapter one that the sigma of a value or the standard deviation of any value q can be defined as the square root of the expectation value of q squared subtracted by the expectation value of q itself squared like this. So that means that our problem boils down to finding five things. We're trying to find the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. We're trying to find the expectation value of the Hamiltonian squared. We're trying to find the expectation value of x. We're trying to find the expectation value of x squared. Or sorry, uh, these squared terms are supposed to go into the expectation values like this. 
And then finally, we're trying to find d expectation x by dt. So uh, this, this is going to result in some pretty annoying math. Uh, and honestly, in my opinion, I don't particularly enjoy these problems because these integrals get kind of horrendous after a certain point. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to set up these equations and I'm just going to leave them as is. If you wish to actually solve them, I would highly recommend that you just don't bother and plug them into uh, some sort of calculator online. Um, because honestly that starts going a little bit more into the tedious realm of sort of math drills instead of actually looking at the physics. So, you know, if you feel like your math needs a little bit of pr practice, we're touching up by all means, actually go ahead and solve these integrals in all their painful glory. If not, you know, just make sure that you understand how to set these up and make sure that your setups are correct and from there you might as well just move on to the next problem because otherwise you're going to be here for the better part of a day trying to do all of these integrals. So let's uh, start by setting up the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. Okay, so the nice part about finding the expectation value for the Hamiltonians is that we don't even need to do an integral for this. This is literally just a calculation. Uh, we know that the time independent wave function for an infinite well is just going to have us attach, you know, that wiggle factor, the exponential, so psi, of x comma t for an infinite square well is just going to equal square root of 2 over a times sine n pi x over a times the exponential of negative i n squared omega t, where omega is just equal to h bar pi squared over 2 m a squared, right? And you know, for the wave function that we're given in problem 2.5, we found that the constant a was equal to 1 over root 2. So that means that psi of x comma t for our wave function 2.5 is equal to 1 over root a times sine pi x over a times the exponential of negative i omega t plus 1 over root a times sine of 2 pi x over a times x exponential of negative 4 i omega t, right? So in terms of, you know, the time independent wave function, we can rewrite this in terms of, you know, the actual psi 1 and psi 2 terms, which is going to be 1 over root 2 times psi 1 of x times the exponential of negative i omega t plus 1 over root 2 times psi 2 of x times e to the negative 4 i omega t. Once again, we already solved this in 2.5, so I'm not going to go over it in too much detail. I'm just going to gloss over it. Go back to that video if you're confused about what is happening. Uh, and you know, these coefficients at the front tell us the probability of being in any specific state, right? If you actually measure the system, so that means that the probability of e1 is equal to the probability of e2 for this problem, which is exactly equal to just one half. In that case, you know, if there's a 50% chance of being in the first state and a 50% chance of being in the second state, you have a 50% chance of having an energy of E1 or a 50% chance of having an energy of E2, where En is the energy of just the stationary states for the infinite square well, which is n squared pi squared h bar squared over 2ma squared, as we see, as we sort of saw when we solved this in chapter one, right? Or the early part of chapter two. I don't remember when this was covered. Uh, either way, uh, the expectation value, aka the average energy, right, is just going to be one half e1 plus one half e2, right? And this is going to give you just like five pi squared h bar squared over ma squared. Similarly, right, the expectation value of h squared, this is the average value of energy squared, which is going to be one half e1 squared plus one half e2 squared. And this is going to give you like 17 uh, times h bar to the fourth times pi to the fourth over 8 m squared h to the fourth. So that's the easy part of this problem out of the way. Now let's do the expectation value of position. Okay, so once again, uh, I'm not going to go through sort of the horrid process of actually doing the integrals for the expectation value of x and x squared, right? Those, I, I don't really care um, to, to sort of waste the next two hours sort of doing that. So let's just write out the system. And then from there, if you actually want to solve it, you know, shove it into a calculator or actually go through the trouble of doing these horrid integrals. Uh, so we know, once again, rewriting this psi of x comma t is going to be for this system, one over root two times psi one of x times e to the negative i omega t 
plus 1 over root 2 times psi 2 of x times e to the negative 4 i omega t. So if we want to find the expectation value of x, well, this is equal to the integral from negative infinity to infinity of psi star times x times psi dx, which is just, you know, so I'm going to factor out the 1 over root 2 just to make my life a little bit easier. Uh, and then psi 1 e to the negative i omega t plus psi 2 e to the negative 4 i omega t. And at this point, this is going to give me the integral from negative infinity to infinity. So both of these terms are going to pull out a 1 over root 2. So that's just going to become a 1 over 2 at the front. And we have psi 1 e to the negative i omega t plus psi 2 e to the negative 4 i omega t star times x times psi 1 e to the negative i omega t plus psi 2 e to the negative 4 i omega t. Nice thing about you know these integrals is that thank god we're not working with the expectation value of momentum. We don't have to worry about derivatives and the order of this middle term. We can just move it to the left. So half integral negative infinity to infinity x times psi 1 star e to the positive i omega t. And in fact, we don't even need to use these stars because remember, psi 1, that's a stationary state. It has no complex terms, right? Uh, where is it? Yeah, our psi n terms, as we defined at the front here for our infinite square well, do not have imaginaries. So their complex conjugates equal each other. So psi 1 e to the positive i omega t plus psi 2 e to the positive for i omega t times psi 1 e to the negative i omega t plus psi 2 e to the negative 4 i omega t. Close with the dx at this point, right? Let's do distributive. So this is going to be like what? Uh, psi 1 squared plus psi 1 psi 2 e to the 1 minus 4, so negative 3 i omega t, uh, plus psi 1 psi 2 e to the positive 3 i omega t plus psi 2 squared. And at this point, you just shove this into an integral calculator, right? And if you're doing the expectation value of x squared, right, once again, thankfully, we're working with x, which is a very nice operator. This is going to be 1 half negative infinity to infinity of the exact same thing, but just with x squared instead. So let's just copy this over like this, right? And our, we, you know, we shove this into our calculator as before. Life is easy and simple. Uh, similarly, finally, the thing we want is, uh, you know, dx by dt. So you literally, you know, once you get the actual answer for this, what it actually equals, you just take its time derivative, you get dx by dt. Uh, finally, after that, you shove everything into this and you verify that the result is indeed greater than or equal to h bar over 2. And with that, you're done with this problem. So uh, once again, I'm not going to go through the trouble of solving these integrals. I just think it's not really worth my time. Um, and let's move on to the next problem.